Alright guys, welcome back to another Steam Free to Play walkthrough. Today we have Fall Streak. Which is a visual novel that I know nothing of, but we will figure it out together. Peering down from the sky above, a gold eye, golden eye strains to remain as open as sleep tugs at its eyelids. Damn, reading is hard when you're drunk. Oh my goodness. A solitary house lies draped in its fading warmth, nestled in the land like a an egg waiting to hatch. At least the text is pretty quick. At its side stands a withered old tree, weathered old tree. The swing that hangs from its rest, it rests in under stillness, lacking any wind to stir. Okay. Nice. We made it. There's no wind, and we got a swing set, so it's good life. Within the house, silence settles softly around the figure of a sleeping young girl, like the downy feathers of a newborn chick. This dude's using too many big words. Her eyes flicker and shift as she begins to awaken. Wakey, wakey, eggs and bakey. Yo. Whoa, she trans. Whoa, she teleported. The first breath of awakening escapes my lips as the world fades into view, like after a dream. A ceiling different from the one that belonged to my room could be seen dappled in lo golden light. Okay, this is a little bit too advanced for me. I see upon falling asleep that I had returned to this place, a timeless realm that existed somewhere between the waking world and the world of dreams, a place where no one, no one, where one never went hungry and the sun never moved from the spot in the sky. All right, wait a second. How do you know nobody went hungry ever in this world? Like you just got here, whoever you are. Once again, I was back at that place. You're using too many descriptions. At least, mm. Though time wasn't an issue in the golden dream, sitting around became unbearable rather quickly. Let's go outside. Okay, we're going outside. The vivid golden light of an eternal sunset fills my vision as I exit the house. With no particular destination in mind, I start moving my legs towards the horizon. Eventually, the house behind me shrinks but a tiny dot in the distance. But even then, green grass is the only thing that stretches out before me. I had done this many times already, so I knew. Okay, this is kind of fine because the character knew this was like an eternal fucking place before the author told us like 15 times in 20 different ways. The Golden Dream was a wrapping world. No matter what direction you went, if you continued in a straight line, you always ended up back at the house. Isolated and closed off, it wasn't wrong to think of a golden dream as a, a prison. But if so, the waking world of so Socatrine was just as much of a prison. Hmm, it's going to be a hassle to walk a full loop back around to the house. Ah, you're here. She knows I'm here? The presence had appeared in my side during my aimless wonder wondering. Though, calling it a presence was a bit of a stretch, seeing as how I couldn't see, hear, or touch it. How then did I know it was there? Well, let's just say there's a ton, a lot of things that don't make sense in this place. Okay, she's been here for a while, and I'm just getting in here. Good evening, Tubby. Don't call me Tubby. Tubby, a childish name I had given the material being a long time upon noticing it for the first time. That's not nice. This tubby didn't rec exactly have much to work with in terms of characteristics. I had never been able to call up, come up with a better name. Oh well, you like the name Tubby, don't you? No, I don't! Stop flaming me! Though Tubby appeared at my side during my stays in the Golden Dream every now and then, it was hard to say it offered much in the form of company. Although, there are things I can only do when you're around. This is like six wall breaking. This is breaking all the walls. Lowering myself to the grass, I start visualizing... I start to visualize a bicycle in my head. I'll try conceptualizing every aspect of the bicycle bike that I can, from its metal frame to its air fill tires. I even go to the extra mile and imagine cute little bear, bell perched on the handlebars. Concentrating deeply, I shut my eyes. With a slow inhale, I begin my contemplating on the image to a peak. <sighs> Upon opening my eyes, I find the very bicycle I envisioned standing before me as if it were 
as if it had been here all along. Been there all along. Wow, it came out pretty nice. Let's give it a go. I try mounting the bike. Oh, she fell to the ground. But the poor contraption immediately falls apart under my weight. It's sending me plummeting to the ground with a heroic face plant. Oh, wow. Ooh, ooh. I don't know why, but whenever Tubber, Tubby is with me, tinkering around with the fabric of this world becomes pos possible. There are limits to what I can do, though. Anything I try to insatiate possesses complete fidelity to my vision. The complications arise if I don't truly understand what I'm trying to conceive. Though I understand the general theory behind how a bike worked, when you get down to the nitty gritties, it's a complex machine that requires many parts to work together in harmony to it perform its function. She forgot cogs. Oh well, now planning on being a bicycle mechanic when I grow up anyways. Disheartened, I detach the bell from the broken down bike and give it a ring as I resume my journey on foot. But it only creates a dull and pitiful sound like clapping wood before crumbling to dust in my hand. Well, looks like we can cross building bells off our list of ambitious, ambitious dreams as well. Upon returning to the house, I stop and ponder the motionless swing under the tree. Several hours had already passed. Not that it really mattered. For I knew it, the tree- oh god. Knew it, the tree was creaking and groaning overhead like a grandpa cajoled into giving a kid a piggyback ride. My goodness, these words they're using. As I sway, sway through the air, my thoughts stray onto a particular avenue. I wonder if God has woes. Oh, don't start thinking too hard. I don't need you using big words and thinking too hard. Nature had veracity of such a, <laughs> an existence aside. It was the implication of being all-knowing that interested me. Omniscience. In a way, it could be said I possessed a certain degree of it when I came to the Golden Dream. There is nothing that ever happens here without my knowledge after all, because nothing changes in this place unless I dictate it, unless I dictate or define so. I wonder if it's the same. I wonder if, from God's perspective, the universe doesn't change unless they dictate or define so. If so, I can't think of omniscience as anything more than a curse. If my time in the Golden Dream has taught me anything, it's that experiencing new events beyond your control is an irreplaceable treasure. If you have omniscience, that's not possible, by the way. So, counterpoint, destroyed. There is beauty in having things. Happen even when you do not will them to. If you have omniscience, that means you just know everything, so that's not. But looking forward to a helpful tomorrow full of seemingly endless possibilities is a privilege of transient and unknowing. For an omniscient being, nothing is random, nothing is unexpected, nothing is unknown. Well, at least I know. Tomorrow would only hold the promise of a predetermined eternal eternality. It would be like being trapped in the golden dream forever. Just imagining it is feel suffocating. Eh, anyways, your tub turn, Tubby. Bringing the swing to a halt, I take a seat on the grass and cover my ears. Darkness fills my vision as I shut the everlasting sunset from my eyes. There's one thing that kept my mind from breaking in this golden purgatory. It was that I had Tubby by my side. Even though Tubby never acts on its own without my input or prompting, the fact that its presence allows me to be believe in a will other than my own is my lifeline. Oh god, that's an annoying noise. When I let go of my ears and open my eyes, I bl briefly hear the sound of creaking. Looking back, I catch sight of the swing gliding through the air. Thuck. Ow! I flop gracefully onto my back as the swing crashes into my forehead. You're such a bully, Tubby. Well, you could have dodged it if you're omniscient. Though so everything I had transpired according to my sign- Oh, putting the blame on Tubby. Instilled my needed collar to the bleak reality. Okay, she's like, too far gone. It'd be nice if we could play together. Playing on the swing wasn't as fun when there was no one to push you. God, she's deep, deep into it. My goodness. <laughs> okay. Poor girl. Jesus. Feels bad, man. That's so depressing. 
I always end up finding myself here, don't I? My cradle and my cage. The celestial ri library. That was the name I had given the sprawling room painted over the stars. Space was distorted in several rooms in the Golden Dream, but it was only here that I f it felt like the heavens itself was spreading out before you. What should I read today? I don't know. Books that couldn't be found in the waking world and books that spoke of the universe beyond Sokotrin's closed realm. Excuse me. There was nothing in this garden of knowledge I had left unread. But it wasn't like I had anything else to do. Picking out a book at random, I settled down on a comfy alcove on the second floor. Go ahead and read to Tubby. I've been reading the whole time. I shut my eyes for a bit as I addressed Tubby. When I reopen them, an open book can be seen lying on the floor by my side. Now what do we have here? None of the books in the Celestial Library had an author or a title. But all it took was a quick glance at the first sentence for me to discern the book's contents. Book's contents. It's been a long time since I've read this one, or perhaps it hasn't been that long at all. A world of only one. It was a story about such a world. As if reflecting the heart of their soul reader, it was a theme of that many of the books in this library shed, shared. Now take me away once more. Let me slip and fall between the pages, the lines. Only for a moment I shall dream. You thought. You can't dream, you're omniscient. Ooh, what's going on here? What a doll. She's got the doll fingers, see the little ridges? That means she's a doll. Once upon a time, there was a world that had lost all but one to time. A lone girl who did not know the warmth of others, yet long for it still. One day she beheld her reflection in the water and had a thought. If the person on the other side were to come over here, I would no longer be alone. It was a simple and childish wish. Yet the girl poured her, poured her everything into that wish. Seconds, minutes, hours, days, months, years. Oh, something, something millennium. Girl created many selves as time tick tocked away. One made of wood, one made of clay, one made of porcelain, one made of plastic. Yet she crafted those selves without end. Dolls that were her very splitting, spitting image. That even moved as she might. Splitting image, I guess. Yet it was not enough for the girl. For while the dolls could move, it was only when she manipulated them to do so. This is just like a self-reflection of the girl that was just talking. A self that had their own thoughts and moved of their own will. Girl labored without end to bring such a self into the world. Until at last, she was finally able to fulfill her wish. A doll created, a beautiful doll created in this girl's own image and dressed in trim of several colors. Upon seeing its eyes open for the first time, the girl voiced the first greeting in her life. Hello, dear dreamer. However, the doll can only stare in silence, for it did not know of words. So the girl smiled deeply and widely from the bottom of her heart, for even if the doll did not know of words, it should know of smiles. That was what the girl thought or rather wished for. You might ha must have so many questions. Let me show you. You're not in your nail. My all fulfilled. Take the doll's hand. Taking the doll's hand in hers, the girl will turn to the water surface where two reflections rippled into the turning of a tale's page. Pages. The jostling of an upended bookmark. Myself, monochrome of seven colors. I am you, you are me. The puppet, the puppeteer, no more. I am you, and you are me. Words spoken with a smile, they carried meaning to the doll cannot grasp. Yet somehow the doll felt it understood. The beautiful world I've always longed to share with someone. Won't you come and play with me? The world had not changed by the doll entering it. Yet to the girl, it felt like the world she had known for time immemorial had been reborn. It was a life the girl had only been able to dream of. She showed the doll many things, teaching it and blessing it with old experiences made new. Laughing, playing, they collected precious treasures together. Memories, dreams, the two held them in their hands. Warm little stones plucked from the sky and placed in a bucket of water and sand. Then one day, as they gazed over the sprawling fields of a world that belonged all to them, the girl asked the doll a question. Is it fun? 
A simple and straightforward question. One the doll should have been able to answer. Yet in the end, it could only cock its head. What is fun? I don't understand. But at the same time, I understand, but at the same time, I do not. <laughs> the answer is good enough for me. Is it? Yes, the reason you're not sure what it fun is, is because it's all you know. Having never felt its absence, you are fully unable to grasp you are unable to fully grasp its presence. Huh. Winter's bite gives form to summer's light. The cold of night makes the sun bold and bright. This is some big brain crap. Oh, I think I get it. The girl's words made the doll wonder about something. Will you show me unfun things as well? Of course. It's important to experience all the colors of life. Even sadness is a necessary sweet pain. Because it lets you know what happiness is. Not enough just to be happy? Even if one knows the utmost happiness, it is but a hollow construct in a vacuum if not complemented or contrasted by the other colors of life. Hollow. A coin with only one side is meaningless. Coins only have a definition and value because they are two sides that can be judged relative to each other. You can't flip a coin and call it heads or tails if there's only one side, can you? You can't. The girl giggled when the doll nodded in understanding. She was playful like this. She was very wise. There was never a moment when the doll was learning something from not learning something from her. Likewise, listen well, dear dreamer. A monochrome happiness has no value. Value. Pleasant, t pleasant tints, painful shades, and tone that meld the two together. They're all treasures. It is for that reason you are not. You are adorned in seven colors. Even things that are painful and sad should be wished for. That's what the girl said. But if so, all the colors must be. Is there something that must not be? The canvas graced by all the colors of light saw it. The blank canvas what is not? What is going on here? Stop! As if reading the doll starts, the girl shook her head. A canvas that is blank can simply be painted over. No, what must be, not be allowed is a canvas that is never shared. Something changed about the girl at that moment. Yes, no matter how many canvases teeming with colors you could paint, if they are not shared, they are truly never complete. A voice that has always been br full of brightness and warmth was now dyed a cold and distant in shade. You know, did you know, dear dreamer, no matter how much I wish to, I can't create a story because a story is a world and the minimum amount of people required to create a world is two. A writer can pin enough bugs to circle the horizon but without a reader, a story can never be born of it. Without a reader, a book is nothing but a one-sided coin. No matter how much the author wishes for it, no matter how much they put their soul into it, a story cannot be realized alone. Bitterness, frustration, sorrow, and despair. This is like the author pending to the reader. Really well done though, this is actually super good. It was an expression the girl had never shown the doll before. The image of a stranger and someone familiar overlapped, making the doll afraid to reach out. But more than anything, it did not want to see the girl make such a face. So it spoke up, giving voice to its deepest desire. It takes two people to create a world. And let me be that second person. Let me be your other half. The doll wanted to see the girl smile again, because without it, it was lost. Please, I don't know what I can do, but I want to help you. Won't you let me? The doll's heartfelt plea, no, was met only with rejection. Words that carried the doll's earnest wish, they fell to the ground unvoiced and unrealized. You can't. You can't create a world with me. Why? Why can't I? This is getting too, this is getting depressing. Why can't I? Because you do not possess a will of your own. Her will is to help you! God, you suck! What do you mean? Am I not here? Am I not speaking with you at this very moment? That too is just a lie. The words you speak are not your own. They are but a product of a script. The girl's eyes were alien foreign. They were the eyes of a stranger the doll did not know. The doll did not understand. The girl who would gaze upon it 
with warm eyes and caress it with tender hands. Now only coldness dwelled within her eyes, a gulf that could not be traversed, having opened up between the two. The doll could not bear it. It wanted the girl it held dear to come back. And so it asked the girl, Why do you forsake me? I do not forsake you. You already... Yes, you do. Yes, you, you do. No, it is myself who I forsake. Because there is no one else after all. There is no one else in this world but me. I am here. I exist. You are nothing but a doll. The doll could not accept this girl's world's words. And so compelled by a denial that nearly desperated, it lashed out at the girl. This was something unexpected happened when the doll's hands made contact with the girl. This is the clanky sound it fell to the ground, fallen to the ground, the girl's arm. An arm of not of flesh and blood, but of a doll. There's nothing left for me to hide, is there? Singing to her knees, the girl cradled the arm lying on the ground. Her hunched figures seem to incredibly small to the doll. Most of my body has already been replaced by doll parts. I am almost as much of a doll as you. The girl has spared nothing, not even her own body, and your, her yearning to create another self. It is for that reason that I know. Strings that attach the body and soul are the same as that which controls dolls. Dolls like you don't have any soul of their own. They are simply being inhabited by me. Strings that bestow life and movement upon the girl's creations. Those very strings were the girl's chains. Dolls under my control cannot do anything beyond what I dictate. Even when they laugh, cry, and sing, those actions never stop being my own. Even you, dear dreamer, you cannot move it unless I command it. You are incapable of displaying the script I write for you. Most importantly, the pain of being omniscient. You are incapable of writing your own script. Doll did not what, know what to say, it did not know how to feel. Perhaps it was shock, or perhaps it was because the girl had not determined what the girl, doll might feel or say. You understand now, don't you? Why well, you can't create a world with me. Because I am you, and you are me. A spell to break the glass sill. If it left the doll's mouth unbidden. I am all alone in this world. The eternally representing present. I deceived myself, deluded myself into thinking it was finally over. After so long, my time has finally begun to move. After so long, I fi I'll finally be able to reach the future. That's what I thought. But I, it was all just a hollow facade. As one, the doll and girl spoke of the cold truth that lay beneath the gilded wonderland. Imagined worth, warmth, fabricated color. In the end, I'm nothing but a lonely girl playing with dolls by herself. Something wet and clear began to stream down the doll girl's face. It was proof she was human, proof she was alive. And as the doll could not do the same, it was proof she was the only one in the world. A world like this, I don't need it anymore. I cannot bear it anymore. A world of only one that continued to turn fruitlessly in broken cog. Tired of it. So, so tired. Just wants rest now. The last thing I will have you do, dear dreamer, is end this life of mine, I figured. The moment it extended from the doll's arm, a terribly cold denial and affirmation wrought with steel. He is already in the silver lock. All that's left to do is turn it. With mechanical steps, the doll marched forward. This is a girl directed, just as her will desired. Don't do it. If you do it, you prove that you have your own will. <laughs> In the end, I knew exactly what I was doing, didn't I? The reason I, that I created you was to free me from the unending dream. As if guided by invisible strings, the doll's body moved forward. One, two, the doll advanced towards the girl, tensing, rotating its arm. Now, then, this dream has gone on for too, far too long. It's time to wake up. With arms spread wide, the girl, is, the girl welcomed the doll into her chest, embracing it sweetly, tenderly, as the doll's seven colors turned into one. Red, the colorful canvas. Red, the monochrome canvas. Vibrant and vacant, it became overwhelmed with the singular hue. So dark, so cold. Is this death? It's scary, isn't it, dear? Dreamer. The doll answered it did not. 
a tear running down its porcelain cheek, red as a rose, it was not clear, not clear like the raindrops that flowed down the girl's face. Alone, that's how it's, I've been all my life. But at the very least, I don't want to die that way. Someone at my side, that's how I wanted it to end. Won't you grant me, grant that last, that small wish of mine, dear dreamer? It was then the doll's mouth moved, giving voice to one ge last gentle lie. I am here, by your side. We shall sleep together, for I am you and you are me. And so the world, only one, became that of none. And the last, as the last that remained, slipped into eternal repose. Response. Response. That's so sad. That's so fucked up. I did not like that. When I came to, I found myself lying on the bed. Even before I opened my eyes, I knew. So here, huh? Curling into a loose ball, I find the book I had picked up out, picked up out by my side. I roll my fingers across the book's nameless binding. Its blank roughness corresponds. A world where nothing is unexpected and everything is defined by you. The universe of only one. I wonder, what if people were to God as dolls were to this girl? Pretty much. Dolls cannot act on their own, and the puppeteer that controls them can never be ignorant of what they would do. Because on a intrinsic level, their actions are the puppeteers. In a similar vein, people can laugh, cry, and sing. But is their laugh and lamentations a product of their free will? Depends on what you believe in. Or is it simply the dictation of an unscripted scene script? <sighs> Creating an existence other than your own and breathing life into it, loving it with all your heart, and giving it your everything. Yet no matter what you do, it will never be able to escape the intrinsic quality of being an ex but an extension of your soul. The despairing of knowing your creation can never possess free will or the capacity to grow on its own. It makes you question if you yourself have free will. It makes you question if even God has free will. For an omniscient entity knows everything exactly, even about its own decisions in the future. Does that not forbid free will to that entity? Yeah, it does. So, perhaps free will doesn't even truly exist, not if you believe in omniscience. But even then, I think we should believe that it does. What do you think about it, Tubby? Using to myself, I turned to the, my gaze to the ground next to the bed. The book I had picked up out for Tubby in the Celestial Library was laying there, with not a single page turned. What are you, a bumpkin? Don't doze off. At the mere side of a book, at least try to read some of it. When I blink and look at again, Tubby's book, which had been on the first page, was suddenly on the last. You're not fooling anyone into thinking you're reading all that in the blink of an eye. I'm quite conscious of the fact that everything in this exchange is merely part of a script I've imagined, but spirited facades like that were important for keeping my sanity intact. I'm just like the girl in this story, aren't I? Yeah, I know that. Life's most fundamental quality is that it's the first non-existence. Perhaps it could even be said that it was life's most intrinsic purpose to be something rather than nothing. Something anything that defies nothingness. Anything everything that fills the world with color and movement. It was the most base and pure of impet impetus. Impetus? Impetus? I don't know. A blank canvas must be painted over it, no matter what that means. But even the most beautiful canvases are as null as dust if not shared. I heave a heavy sigh as I rest my head on the book. Being left alone here for not so long, nothing but your th own thoughts gnaws at you, I bet. Since I never got tired here and there was no right. The only thing to dictate when I slept was whim. Entry and exit from the Golden Dream didn't seem to have any rhyme or reason to it. There have been times where I've awakened in the alternative, where after simply shutting my eyes for a bit. Uh, hmm. Good evening, Tubby. Oh, she fell asleep again. Mumbling something that wouldn't make sense anywhere else, I begin to doze off. As I'm fading away, for some reason I s stuck with the inexplicable conviction that Tubby would make for an amazing pilly. No, please. There'll be pillows for sale, but I won't get one free. No refunds will be issued for some odd reason your product has no actual physical form. Stop blaming me, dude. Let me live. The 
Sound of Chirping Birds, a song that brings me release so sweet I feel my entire body going into slight relief. As my eyes adjusted the warm sunlight flowing through the window, I let out a breath so deep one would think I'd been holding it the entire night. A light breeze rushes, rustles the curtains, brushing against my cheek the way one would tenderly caress someone to ease them from their slumber. It's probably something few others would ever think about, but the air of that the world we live in is alive. It's full of movement, weight, and subtle sense. There's a sense of texture to it that the golden stream, I don't know what that means, or sat's air can never compare to. Sots. I'm back. The sights and sensation of waking world fills me with a madden, madden, maddeningly similar, familiar hunger, like the desire to gorge on the rich stimuli surrounding me. Speaking of eating, something smells good. The appetizing aroma of breakfast being prepared tickled at my nose, prompting me to slip out of the comfort of my bed. You're imagining food being made. After wrapping up my morning dailies, I descend the stairs to the kitchen where a bowl of chicken, Kongi, already awaited me. Who is this? Good morning, Idel. You have a restful night? Yes, it was golden. <laughs> <laughs> Holding up the okay sign, I blow furiously on a spoonful of the hot rice porridge before guiding it to my mouth. Wah! I give a little yelp as my tongue scorches from the unexpected heat. Careful, it's fresh out the pot. Papa makes a troubled expression as he watches me squirm around in my seat. That's your dad? Why has he got night armor on? What is going on? Ha hot! Somewhere the pain, somehow the pain was not well, unwelcome. This too was one of the little tiny treasures of ordinary life after all. You seem to be in high spillers today, Ade. Something happening at school? Papa pushes a glass of water over to me as he prudently wafts his own chow. Hmm. Once liberated from the kanji's searing heat, Angis, I think back to the day before the golden dream. I believe we're having a bridge construction contest today. Ah, oh, that would explain why you were collecting all those materials last night. Will you be able to carry all that all to school though? Seems a bit heavy. Do you doubt my strength? With a swaggering smile, I flex my legendary textbook, coding biceps. <laughs> Please get no teller, no ladder to help you. I promptly finish my meal at the expense of my tongue's outer layers. Usually I'm not too fond of Papa's cooking since he's rather conservative with what he makes. But for some reason, his homely chow kungri was an exception. Anji, I don't know how to say that. After washing up, I retrieve everything I needed and go to put on my shoes. Papa follows along to the door to see me off, as he always does. It's okay if you don't win the contest, you know. Just try to have fun. Reaching down, he rubs the side of my head with the pads of his fingers. It was a familiar and comforting sensation, but somehow it made me feel a little lonely. If I don't win, how will I ever realize my long-standing dream of becoming a master bit bridge builder? As if to escape that lonesome feeling, something facetious escapes my mouth. That's the first I've heard of such a dream. Papa gives a helpless sigh as he withdraws us to saying, oh, Take care of day. Be safe. Bye, Papa. See you later. Jesus. God. What the... What the okay, so we're not stuck in the golden dream. We're just visiting it every now and then. Running out to behold the clear blue sky in the morning was the best way to start a day. But that's not to say I don't lo love running to an overcast sky. A rainy sky, a misty sky, a windy sky, a snowy sky, they are all loving. They were all the best. I find her at the edge of a sprawling green field that makes up our property. A figure so still they seem to blend up into the landscape. Noletta. Good morning, A.D. Her rubescent figure, her rubescent eyes, fixate at me, on me, as she greets me with a blank expression. Wrong. Reaching out with both index fingers, I push the corners of her mouth up. Greetings should be done with a smile. 
<laughs> the head turn. Noletta inclines her head, causing her snow white hair to tickle my wrist. In the morning, a day. <laughs> a giggle escapes me when Noletta tries again with the oddly charming smile I've shaped with my fingers. Good morning, Noletta. I beam a big smile at her to drive my point home. Noletta Rue. A girl shrouded in mystery to the point where even her age is unknown. She was clearly older than me, though, with an appearance that she dressed her around 14 or 15, if I had to guess. She looks like 12 to me, but despite that, she was very in innocent, alarmingly so, in fact. One time when we sent her on an errand at the bakery, she almost ended up stealing, utterly oblivious to the concept of exchanging currency for goods. That's why I liked her so much, though. Her presence has the effort of making even the familiar routine feel new and fresh, as if you were experiencing the world for the first time again. Strangely liberating, watching Noeletta stare in awe at something, as simple and mundane as someone kneading dough, for example. The world is full of ordinary treasures that lie unnoticed before us, only we don't realize it unless it is framed in the eyes of another's innocent. Ah, oh, what is what is this big brain stuff? Even now, Noletta was staring fixedly at the big bag of materials hanging from my back. You remember? We were supposed to bring in materials for a bridge construction project today. Build a bridge? You need materials? <laughs> Noletta makes an expression of wonder, as if the thought had never crossed her mind. I didn't bring materials. It's okay, I got you covered. I brought enough for both of us. Thanks, A.D. Oh, it'll be tasty. Hmm. Destroying conversations like this where it feels like you're not really on the same page with Noletta aren't uncommon. But that's just because her way of thinking is unique. In this case, when I said I bought enough for both of us, she immediately, probably immediately made an association with lunch. So food's on her mind right now, huh? A question vermicelli, friend. Is Bressel already off smelling the flowers? Noletta pauses and stares at me for a moment before nodding. You went cooking with Mr. Damalore. Why am I silly? Wow, perfect score. <laughs> While it may seem odd at first, Noletta's way of thinking is admirably fluid. Yes, yeah, something like that should be admired, shouldn't it? I knew you could do it. Yeah! Bouncing on my fleet, I have reached up and reward her with a happy head pat. Though it is slight, my praise draws a smile from her. Playing with Noletta is the best. It's fun al going along with the train of thoughts, with her train of thoughts. Anyhow, Bristle was Noletta's older brother. Both of the Rue assemblies were quite universe with the war. In the world for their age. It's something I've wondered about ever since they came to reside on our property around a year ago. Okay, let's go meet up with the others. I often think about it though. Noletta's in a lower effective grade than me, despite being a fair deal order, older. It's true that my physical age reflects a little due to the time I've spent in the Golden Dream, but if I'm ahead of my time because of the Golden Dream, for what reason could Noletta be behind in hers? I study Noletta's expressionless profile quietly as I walk by her side. Noletta, Eddie! A voice that can trigger the image of an excited puppy bounding up to you, its tail wagging, interrupts my scrutiny. Just when the voice's owner is about to spring on us, though, she suddenly freezes in place with a frustrated, flustered expression. Oh no, I forgot to try out the Trinity with new surprise greeting that's all the rage nowadays. Been late for that now. Don't look, Noletta. You didn't see me. Hmm. If she clearly doesn't follow, Noletta obediently complies with Lorona's instructions. All right. Roaming behind her, Leona throws her hands over Noletta's eyes. Who is it? Ah, it went dark? 
Guess who it is? Guess who it is? Uh, I, I don't know. Object permanence is something you develop when you're an infant, Noletta. I'll give you a hint, Noletta. It starts with an L and ends with an A. Oh, and you love eating it. it starts with an L and it ends with an A, and it's yummy. Lasagna? <laughs> Don't turn me into pasta casserole! Lasagna. Paying Lerona no need. Noletta takes one of the hands covering her eyes and stuffs it in her mouth. Oh my god. Nom. God, don't eat me! It's Lerona! Lerona, I tell you. Lerona falls in a panic as Noletta latches on with her teeth. Meet Lerona. Though she might strike you as the type of airhead that gets lost tottering around after butterflies, she's quite responsible. Though not a necessarily necessarily reliable individual Ooh. despite being only 15 she is a talented textile artist artisan that helps support the orphanage she cute calls home with her earnings it's a wonder if she has okay i gotta save i'll play this more when i wake up in the morning this will be part one of fall streak I feel like this is gonna be a long game but it's pretty interesting so far it's really big brain it is so the author of this is way more intelligent than me uses really big words and has like a really good setting it's it's pretty interesting so far thanks for watching as always and if you haven't already please like and subscribe bye